What's up guys? I'm Laura from Reading in Bed and this is going to be a Britta Bowler style tops and flops kind of a video. Um, and it's going to be for kind of 2019 year to date just because I've been away for a while. Um, I'm limiting myself to a top three and a bottom three even though I could have and, and wanted to include more, um, especially on the bottom side. I've read a lot of shitty books this year so far, but let's start with the tops. Um, let, let's have some positivity. Um, by far the best book I've read this year is The Golden Mean by Annabel Lyon. Um, just, I mean, the ballsiness alone. This was a debut novel by a, you know, relatively young writer here in Canada, and it's not a thinly veiled coming of age story. Hooray! <laughs> it's a historical novel told from the perspective of Aristotle and focusing on his relationship with Alexander the Great. I mean, that's what I mean, like the ambition of it alone is quite astounding and impressive in, in like a, you know, literature culture or market or whatever where that is not typically the kind of debut novel you see um and she pulls it off it it's just a beautiful uh really spare kind of understated book that um you know it draws on the very few facts that we actually know about aristotle it you know fictionalizes lots of things it's not meant to be a textbook or a reference or anything but i believe that annabelle lyon has a degree in philosophy or something and so i think that like confidence comes through um and you do end up learning a lot as well as being very very emotionally affected um yeah th this was just an incredible book i am super offended that this didn't win the giller prize in the year that it was uh, shortlisted for it some other the bishop's man or something when i don't even know i haven't read it and i don't need to read it to say that this should have won <laughs> um so so that was this was my top read of the year and it, it was pretty recent i had a pretty bad start to the year um but anyways that's number one and if i had to pick a number two uh, i finally got around to uh, the collected stories of jean reese I'm not going to say a lot about this because, I mean, Jean Reese is sort of revered. Uh, well, I guess she's more revered for Wide Sargasso Sea, which I still haven't read, but she's also very well known for her short stories, so I don't really need to, like, convince you, probably, um, that her short stories are incredible. They're incredibly dark and depressing, um, but there's just something about them um, that, that feels so modern and, uh, and relevant today as well. Uh, I also just really like this uh, Penguin Modern Classics cover and, and, you know, we've got the author photo. And of course, this has a short introduction by Diana Athill, who just died. Um, like she died while I was reading this book. Diana Athill was like a longtime sort of editor and collaborator with Jean Reese as well as many other uh, very famous writers. Um, introduction is, is very short and sweet, but it, it's just just what it needs to be. And so it was, it was um, very affecting for me, I guess, to be reading this uh, during uh, when people were sort of reminiscing about Diana Athill, who, by the way, sounds like she's written some incredible memoirs that I need to get to. Okay, um, and then my third uh, top read of the year is My Not So Perfect Life by Sophie Kinsella. Those of you who have watched me for a while know that uh, I love Sophie Kinsella, even though chiclet and genre stuff is not usually my bag, uh, Sophie Kinsella does it so well. And while my not so perfect life is, um, you know, it's got a 25 year old naive single heroine who's trying to make her way through life in London, which describes like 90% of her books and she's written a ton of them. And while you know, a lot of the action was like so heavily foreshadowed and, and telegraphed that it's like, okay, uh, she just, she does it, she's the best. <laughs> you know, ever since I read Shopaholic a million years ago, I've been a huge fan of Sophie Kinsella. Um, you know, she's out here uh, doing chiclet in a way that, that many authors I think try to emulate and, and fall quite short of. And while it is very kind of surface level and light and fluffy, she does usually, you know, get enough kind of darkness and complexity in there that it keeps me interested. And I guess it helped in this book too, that the main character was a, a market researcher, which is what I do for my day job. So, so that was kind of cool. And, and the book is also concerned with, um, like social media culture and Instagram in particular, which um, as some of you know, I have recently extricated myself, like actually deleted my accounts on Instagram and everywhere else. So I'm like interested in those kind of ideas as well. Uh, so, so yeah, well, I, I hope that Sophie Kinsella one day sort of moves on from the 25 year old naive single girl thing. 
it's working for her. <laughs> and it was quite a nice break from some of the heavier and shittier <laughs> books that I ended up reading. So on that note, let's move on to the flops, shall we? Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go in reverse order. So we'll, we'll end with, well, I don't know. Well, I don't know what order these are in. Anyway, let's talk about What If This Were Enough by Heather Havrileski. This was a book I read for spite. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously it was going to be a hate read, right? So Heather Havrileski um, had a tweet that went eh, slightly viral, I'd say, late last year. She said something along the lines of, don't ever tell an author that you're planning to read their new book from the library because, you know, apparently you should only tell them if you're planning to uh, like pre-order the hardcover, I guess. So like predictably this tweet got ratioed. <laughs> um, and this is an author who is extremely online. So she had to either know that that was going to happen and was doing it on purpose, the whole like any publicity is good publicity thing, or is so lacking in self-awareness that she really thought that was like a cool and okay thing to say. <laughs> and I mean, really what she said wasn't that bad. Really, no one should tell any author that they're planning to read their book. Like, why would you? The, the whole concept of that is all wrapped up in the performativeness and narcissism of social media anyway. That's going to be a whole other conversation when I decide to make a video about my thoughts and feelings on social media. But anyway, so <laughs> as soon as I saw that tweet, I'm like, I'm putting this bitch's book on hold at the library. <laughs> so I did. And I ended up reading it on my Libby app. And it was a piece of shit. Like it was honestly, um, it, it's an essay collection. I barely remember any of the essays at this point, but they were all just the worst kinds of word salads that didn't really say anything that talked a lot about the culture, like without specifying what that means. And when people do that, they basically mean like the very limited circle of like colleagues and friends that they interact with. <laughs> they don't mean anything other than that. Um, and uh, the, the only one that stuck out or that continues to stick out to me now is an essay she wrote about Disneyland that was trying so hard to be um, a supposedly fun thing that I'll never do again. And just like, so was not. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it was just a, a collection of meaningless um, platitudes and attempts at wokeness and just, just the worst examples of all of that. So while I went in expecting it to be sort of stupid and, um, but you know, ready to be like, okay, like I went into this under bad pretenses, but it was actually okay. No, it was, it was actually worse <laughs> than I thought it was gonna be. It was terrible. And she writes an advice column so of course I went over to the advice column and that's terrible too. The advice she's giving people is like just complete shit. Like what is going on? Um, anyway, okay. So that was my first flop. Um, second flop is one that um, is really making me question some of your judgment because I got a lot of, uh, you know, recommendations and read a lot of good reviews about this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's The Child Finder by Renee Denfield. This is a terrible book. <laughs> like, I don't even know where to start. Um, like on a sentence level, the writing is terrible and cliched and trite. Um, on a stylistic level, using like whimsical fairy tale style stuff to tell a story about um, child rape is just like gross and weird. Uh, on a child narrator level, the the amount you have to suspend your disbelief to believe some of the things this child narrator thinks and says and understands is just beyond. Um, the cartoonishness of the villain in this book is ridiculous. And then the narrator who is like, who is the child finder, who's like trying to solve this mystery is just, <laughs> and the relationship she has with her like foster brother is also like, gross and not in a good or interesting way. Um, it, God, it, this was just a terrible, terrible book. And I mean, I guess I enjoyed it on a certain level as a hate read because it just like on every level wildly disappointed me, especially because my expectations were quite high because I've read so many good reviews. And, and like I said, people I know and trust liked it too. So maybe there's something wrong with me. It's, 
you know, not beyond the realm of possibility, but uh, I was expecting something on par with Room by Emma Donahue, and this just falls short of it in every conceivable manner. Uh, why I even still have this book in my house, I don't know. This is a piece of shit and I don't even want to own it anymore. <laughs> um, the sequel's coming out soon and lots of people are excited for it. One of the other annoying things is like, the narrator has some deep dark secret and they like just withhold enough information to make sure that you want to read the next book. I will not be reading the next book. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that brings us to the last of the flops. <sighs> I'm out of water. I really, I think I almost need a drink, so hang on. Okay, where to begin? Um, the third and maybe not worst, but most egregious of my flops uh, is Cunt by Inga Muschio, Musio? Um, pardon me. Uh, <laughs> okay, so like trigger warnings, content warnings, I'm going to be saying the word cunt like a hundred times. I'm going to be talking about miscarriage and abortion. So if you're in a place in your life where you don't want to hear someone talking about miscarriages and abortions, like just, you can move on to a different video now. Um, cunt is a book that I and others based on Goodreads reviews thought was going to be about like the word cunt and its use in history, in different societies, um, and, and I was interested in that. It is not about that at all, and that's fine, actually. Like, uh, she kind of addresses that in the first two pages of the book, and it becomes very clear that this is actually about the author's, uh, you know, kind of views on uh, feminism and a very particular brand of, like, third-wave riot girl-ish feminism. Um, which is kind of out of favor now, but uh, that didn't really turn me off because it's something I'm still interested in. Like I, I have read books by like Ariel Levy, for example, who would also sort of fall into that category. Um, yeah, but the, the book itself, well, it has some worthwhile ideas and I will talk about those. It is a total disjointed mess where she's talking about everything from you know, very broadly, like feminism in the 90s and Riot Girl stuff, like I said, to uh, her extremely misguided views on women's health care, uh, to sexual assault, which like there was nothing particularly wrong with her views on sexual, well, there kind of were, but um, just the way she chose to talk about it was like extremely perplexing. Um, it's all over the place. Each chapter feels like a standalone piece. They don't fit together all that well. It, it's all very like, you know, um, specific to her and it's hard to like kind of like see how anyone who wasn't also sort of a punk rock riot girl feminist in early 90s uh, Pacific Northwest could like really relate to any of this. Um, as opposed to, like I said, other, you know, uh, The Beauty Myth, for example, is like, I would say a foundational kind of book in my own feminism. And I think you could read The Beauty Myth, even though lots of it is out of date, but you could still like relate to it and take something from it. This book, eh -eh, no, no, no. Um, but what was really, really uh, like horrifying about this book, and I'll get into a little more detail, is her views on women's health, healthcare, the medical establishment. Now, I will say there is some good stuff in here. She talks about how women should be, need to be like more aware of how our reproductive systems work and how our cycles work and, uh, you know, without interference, shall we say, by whether it's hormonal birth control or, or what have you, that, you know, our bodies work a certain way, they do certain things, our cycles are, you know, in tune with, with different things in nature. Like, it, you know, it, it's, it's a little woo woo and stuff. However, she has a good point here and, and I'm, you know, I get it. Like I came up through the, if you have sex, you will get pregnant and die kind of health classes in the nineties as well. And it's very unhelpful. And I think when I was in my mid twenties probably, and finally learned that actually, no, you can't get pregnant every day of your cycle. There's like three to five ish days that you can get pregnant and the rest. No, you cannot. I was fucking pissed because, you know, like that's what we're told when we're growing up that like you can get pregnant every time you have sex and blah, blah, blah. And like, it's not true. That's not how our bodies work. Um, and that information is like, 
purposefully withheld from us to create kind of like, um, you know, fear and, and sort of like not being in touch with our bodies. Like I, I, yeah, I am here for that, even though it is getting a little woo woo and she's talking about like looking at the moon and you know, whatever. Um, so it's a little out there, but I get what she's saying and it's like, yeah, you know, okay, I'm, I'm sort of here for this and uh, I'm reading along. Then she starts talking about abortion. And uh, she recounts her experiences with, you know, having abortions at, you know, like abortion clinics and sort of the, the typical sort of um, medical, let's say, therapeutic abortion that um, probably hasn't changed very much, I would think, from the 90s. And like many other medical procedures, yeah, it's, it's a fairly, like, dehumanizing experience and it's painful and it's traumatic. Um, I'm not negating any of that. I'm sure that's true. I haven't personally had an abortion, but like none of that rang false to me. But she goes from there to then recounting uh, her last experience with a, an unwanted pregnancy, um, whereby she went a different route, let's say. She uh, took some herbs to basically induce a miscarriage, you know, let's say, or like a spontaneous abortion, um, you know, under no medical care. Uh, but she says like the herbs were just sort of to help things along. What really uh, brought on this abortion and the way she recommends that all of us, you know, take care of our unwanted pregnancies if we want to be rid of them is um, just like thinking really hard about how you want the pregnancy to be, to be over and to, you know, just kind of like, be expelled from your body and like imagining it um, and like spending several days or even several weeks, uh, you know, putting all of your energy into imagining this and picturing it. Um, hopefully you don't have a job or like other children to take care of. Um, and if you do that and also like get some massages, <laughs> which I, like I never really understood that either, um, you will just like spontaneously abort, you know, have a miscarriage. And, and also the experience of having that miscarriage, she described, I think, <sighs> content warning, etc., etc. She describes it as standing in her bathroom and, you know, this kind of clump of cells just plopped out onto the bathroom floor. And it was a very like calm and, and you know, like fulfilling experience. Okay. I am upset, <laughs> so pardon, you know, if this isn't what you were here for, but speaking as someone who has had a miscarriage, uh, not brought on by imagining it, but just, you know, the normal kind of miscarriage that just sometimes happens, that is not what it's like. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure like if you have an early enough one, maybe it is, but for her to like be giving this advice that like if you just like really think hard about having a miscarriage, you'll just have one and it takes like two minutes and then it's over. Um, <laughs> whereas I think many people who have actually, you know, just had a miscarriage can tell you it can also be very painful. It can also mean you're bleeding for weeks on end. Um, you can feel like you're dying. <laughs> um, it can be very frightening and very scary and certainly be a medical event that you need help with. Um, and that's like leaving aside the fact that the whole thing is bullshit. Imagining having a fucking miscarriage is not going to bring one on. You need to get your ass to a clinic <laughs> if you don't want to continue with your pregnancy. Um, it's just, you know, fans of this book talk about like, oh, I wish someone had given this to me as a teenager or I want to give this to my teenage daughter and I'm like holy shit please don't <laughs> like this is not how you deal with an unplanned pregnancy okay and the scary thing too is a lot of the um like description she's using for like traditional kind of abortion is eerily similar to uh, the kind of language that pro-life people use to like deter people. You know, those like protesters and those little quasi women's health clinics that at least here in Edmonton will often be across the street from the legit abortion clinic and try to trick people into going to them instead of to their actual scheduled appointment. That's the kind of imagery and language they use to dissuade people um, from getting the medical care they need, <laughs> okay? Oh, so while she makes some valid points, this kind of stuff is so misguided and so scary and so dangerous. It's just like, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I seriously couldn't believe it. And I mean, there's a lot of like less sort of upsetting examples too, like where she 
um, doesn't think anyone should use tampons or pads, that you should literally just shove a sea sponge up your cunt <laughs> since we're using the C word. And it's like, I mean, just from a hygiene perspective, <laughs> like what? Uh, oh my God. Um, it, it's really unfortunate because there are some interesting ideas in here. Um, the writing itself is kind of like, it, it's a very informal um, blog posty zine kind of language that you know, it's going to work for some people and that's fine. But the actual content, especially around abortion, but like just around health in general is just so out there and so batshit crazy <laughs> that like calling this an important feminist text is just like, I just, I just can't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I, I probably hate it. The child finder more. I think this, I think cunt has to be my, my number one flop just be, because of what I just described. Um, because it, it's, it's just so crazy. It, it's so, um, uh, it's so problematic. And I guess what I would say is if you already have a fairly good foundation in feminist theory and in women's health, um, go ahead and read it like for entertainment value and for the, you know, the, the several good ideas that are in there. But, um, I despair of anyone reading this book as either their first or their primary source of either feminist theory or women's health. Like God help you, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I guess the only other thing to say about it is she does reference uh, the Scum Manifesto, which I've been meaning to read ever since it was mentioned on Adam uh, from the Mental Mori's channel. So, I mean, that's a good thing, I guess, that I'll probably finally get to that. But, oh man, problematic people, okay? Um, so yeah, that's it. Those were my tops and flops. Uh, sorry if you didn't come here to hear the C word a bunch of times and, and talk about miscarriages and stuff, but... Uh, it's out of my system now, so to speak. So, uh, so yeah, we'll move forward and, uh, thanks for watching.